God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. There are so many people I want to thank for this open door. Tonight, I am preaching a sermon that I believe is possibly the most important I've ever preached in my life. But I can't preach it until we do something. I want you to stand up right now. Well, I, you feel something in this room? Is anybody? There's a miracle working anointing right now. There's a power from heaven. The devil cannot have America. I'm gonna say it again. Satan, you cannot have America. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. And then it says, shout. And I want you to hold that shout for a second. Unto God with a voice of triumph. When Moses came off the mountain, listen very carefully. He heard the noise down in the, in the plains when Israel had defiled himself. And Joshua said, it sounds like people that are at war. He said, they're not at war, they're playing. That's not the sound of war, it's the sound of playing. Today it is my sworn duty to end the American Christian era of playing games. And for us to find the shout of war. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout! 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 I want you to look at the person beside you and say this to him. You must be a genius. <laughs> say, uh, because you decided to sit next to me, you must be a genius. <laughs> and explain to them, because this is where the fire is going to fall, right here. Where I'm standing, that's where the fire is going to fall. How many of you want a, a word from God tonight? Do you? Um, I want you to be seated. We're going to get busy. Who is adequate for a moment like this? I'm standing in the pulpit of Andrew Womack. And I'm going to try to preach. It's like challenging Betty Crocker to a bake-off. How many of you love this man of God? Would you clap? <clears throat> to say it is an honor to be here, when I teach a class on preaching, one of the things I tell young students is, don't use any cliches in your sermon. Check for cliches. And don't say things like, it's an honor to be here. Because everybody says that. When you use a cliche, the danger is that your audience is going to say, this guy is going to say only stuff I've ever heard before. So it is quite an honor for me to be here. <laughs> because distinctly, this is one of the most important Christian properties in the world. How many of you believe that? And why not the devil's worst nightmare come out of this sermon tonight. Why not? You know, after I was sitting right over here watching this astonishing production, and I'm going, give me a massive break. I'm gonna go up there after that. I said, I'm gonna go over like a pregnant pole vaulter. How many of you know you can't unsee that, can you? 
so I searched my wife, who I'd like to introduce to you, Michelle Marillo, a, a powerful woman of God. I'm, I'm in love with my wife. Would you stand, dear? Would you greet Michelle Marillo? Right there? Thank you. I wanted to know the verse that the Lord had put on my heart for tonight. And I'm going to warn you what the title is in a moment. It was Psalm 11:3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? In that question, there is no mention of should the righteous do something. There's no reference to the choice. Something has to be done. American Christianity is faltered more on one point than any other. She has been slow to action and slow to understand her duty in the crisis that she's in. How could we have expected millions of Christians to vote right when we banned the Bible from our pulpits? I mean, if you know, I'm just going to say it like it is. That's all there is to it. Because that's what this pulpit is used to. What can we do? What should we do? It is important when you preach a sermon, look me in the eye, that you know that you heard from God. We don't need speculation. We certainly don't need someone up here to wordsmith or come up with some ideas that will move you. We need truth. We need unvarnished truth from heaven. For that truth to come through the voice, the man has to die to self. The woman has to die to self. They have to die to their opinion. They have to die to their need for their reputation. Recently, I was called a celebrity. I've never been so insulted in my life. <laughs> Especially as hard as I have worked not to be one. But I looked at them and I said this, the gift of celebrity is a line of credit to be exhausted in the act of telling the truth. If you look at Christ, he would speak and the crowds would swell. Then he would drop a truth bomb and the herd would be thinned. The curse of our era is that American preachers are fighting to expand and sustain their celebrity when they should be sacrificing everything in order to spare America the insanity of the Democratic Party. The title of tonight's sermon, which is vague and apologetic, Your Christian Duty to Destroy Wokeness. This uh, little book called Born for Battle, written by Arthur Matthew years ago, he, he wrote, why did I write this book, Born for Battle? We don't know, need to get into the book and I'm only gonna re reference it for a little while. 30 years ago, he said, my burden relates to the flood of evil that the devil is pouring into the world. And at the same time, the passivity of many of God's saints as they view this state of affairs and their ignorance of the part God expects them to play in this warfare against Satan. That is part and parcel of what I'm going to present to you tonight. And I'm going to beg your patience because we have gotten used to the 12 minute express sermon that gives us nothing. That you get into church in a golf cart, go past the coffee station to look at a preacher with big screen skinny jeans and fog machines 
And you don't come out with anything from God. You come out with an immunity to God. Now, I'm not going to destroy conviction. I'm going to enhance it. I want to make you good and mad. I want you to become the devil's worst nightmare. I want you to look at yourself and say, the day of my compromise, my apathy, and my confusion about what God wants me to do, about what's going on in America, it dies today. Today I'm a soldier. Today I'm a warrior. Somebody help me right now. Today I'm going to become Satan's worst nightmare. How many of you want to be that? What is the part that God expects us to play? One day, David listed the weapons of Israel. In the Chronicles, it was listed. And it talked about each tribe and what their expertise in military battle was. Some that were good with chariots and spears and sword, others with other strengths. Then it got to the sons of Issachar and described the weapon. Men who knew the times and what Israel should do. I'm gonna put all my currency on the table. I'm gonna sacrifice any kind of favor I may have with you to tell you that it is the sworn duty of every born again Christian now to oppose transgenderism, abortion, and wokeness in the United States. And Pastor, In the old mafia movies, they talked about conciliaries. They talked about counselors who counseled the mob. And they had what they called a peacetime conciliary. And then they had a wartime conciliary. I'm going to read a letter from a Christian attorney. He said, Pastor, we're in war. It's here. It's in our cities. It's in our neighborhoods and our churches. You are now a wartime pastor. I don't care who you are in this room. You are now a wartime pastor. Not a peacetime pastor. You're a wartime pastor. Start acting like one. What were the good and faithful pastors doing during World War II, World War I? There were lots of people dying during those wars. Did they give in? Did they hunker down? No. We attacked the enemy head on no matter what the cost. The enemy is the spirit of fear. You should be organizing your churches. Get everyone down to the school board meeting, the county commission meeting, the city council meeting. Get your folks to start working together. Lead them. Start getting ready for what everyone can see is coming. The time for churches to provide widespread medical care is nearly here. With vaccination mandates, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how we haven't made the connection between someone saying, you take this mark or you can't buy or sell. How did that not get in your brain? Your members are going to be fired for their jobs. They may have trouble finding gainful employment. They need help, a kind of help you have never dealt with before, and there will be a lot of them. And I'm going to stop reading this letter, and I'm going to look you in the eye. I disagree with the tone of that letter. While I agree with some of it and the wording, I disagree. I believe that the hand of God is going to spare America from the agenda of wokeness, and that a miracle is even at the door. If you were to ask me what our moment is, I would say that we are in 1941, the morning after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, the day of infamy. That's where we are. In 1941, the United States was just crawling out of the Great Depression. Five days later, Nazi Germany declared war on us. Now we have a war on the West and a war in the East. We have the European theater and the Pacific theater. And the problem is that the greatest evil the world had ever known 
has to be confronted by American industry. America has to build the greatest war machine the world has ever known to save freedom. The problem is, is that our president at the time, Franklin Nella Roosevelt, knew there were only four men that could do it. Henry Ford, Henry J. Kaiser, William Boeing, Pierre DuPont, four men who had the power to build the American war machine. And he had vilified them. He had won the presidency by getting them to be the villains of America. He had spent so much time demonizing these four industrialists that they now wanted nothing to do with him. Somehow, he had to do a miracle. Sit them down and say, Whatever you have against me and whatever I have against you doesn't matter diddly. And today, you are not Baptist, Assembly of God, Methodist. You are not anything but an American, born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and we must drop our differences. I'm going to say it again. We must drop our differences and do what? Build the American revival war machine. Somebody shout right now. Is wokeness on a level of evil as Nazism? 70 million deaths from abortion, pretty well qualified. The pandemic destruction, the manipulation of our educational system, the abuse of power, the control and the lockdown of churches. I have three videos that it, of public school teachers that if I were to show them to you, you would be so horrified. One is boasting of tr telling first graders about gay sex and kinky moves, she says. Another is standing in front of third graders and say, children, today your teacher is coming out. I'm neither male nor female. I'm not binary. And the children are just staring at him. A third that is boasting that the American flag was taken out of her classroom. And she explained to her children that every day they were saying the Pledge of Allegiance to a blank wall until she put up the flag for the gay militant movement. She said, this flag makes me feel safe. I want all of you to understand there are no exemptions from the war we are in. Pastor, you are not exempt. You are not exempt. You tell me you can't preach politics in your pulpit and to say to me, I cannot preach politics in my pulpit is the most political thing you could ever say. <laughs> now, so, Pastor accused me of being a politician. I said, I'm a soul winner. I win souls. I only began writing this blog because the Lord said, I want you to write the blog. And I said, I don't want to get political. He said, you're not going to be political. You're going to be telling the truth. So immediately all these doors started slamming shut. And one pastor of a mega church got me. And he said, you're, you're nothing but a politician. So I looked at him and I said, are, are you preaching against abortion? Are you preaching against same-sex marriage? Are you attacking transgenderism and the manipulation of the racism of critical race theory? He said, no. I said, why? And sometimes people, if you ask them, they slip. They go, I would lose members. And I looked at him. I said, you mean you lose votes? I said, you're the politician, not me. We're at a point where if you're a pulpit, you're refusing 
to talk about abortion, if you're refusing to attack the manipulation of our children, if you're refusing to act, then you as a pastor are a traitor. And you know what? You are a traitor to your own people. And let me explain. How many of you give me a few more minutes? How many of you still love me? <laughs> but you're a wonderful audience. I was preaching in Fresno. We did a rally before a tent crusade. Many, many people showed up, including several pastors. And I am a pastor's best friend. If you're a pastor, I'm in your corner. I believe the local church is God's secret weapon. I believe that an anointed local church is the single greatest way to get from where we are back to reformation. But I'm not for the hypocrite. I'm not for the phony. I'm not for the false, carnal, entertainment-centered preacher. But let me tell you something. That night, God did something in that meeting in Fresno. There were about 50 pastors with the crowd. And I walked out and I, I did something I've never done before. I said, how many of you in this room have had a child suspended from school because they wore a Christian t-shirt? Hands went up. How many of you have been fired because someone looked on your Facebook page and saw Christian values? Hands went up. So how many of you right now are being threatened at work continually if you don't abandon your Christian values? And hands went up. And I looked at the pastors and I said, what are you preaching to help these people? And you know what? If you look at the landscape of the American church, the sermons that are coming out of our pulpits are absolute nonsense. Let me finish. That are disconnected with reality. They have nothing whatsoever to do with what's going on in the nation, what's going on in the people, but it is a moment of nostalgia. You see, they are yearning to go back to the pre-pandemic Christianity. They're yearning to believe that we can say and do and preach the same old doctrines we always preached, and it grew the church and refused to admit it. The difference is, is Franklin Delano Roosevelt sat down with DuPont and Kaiser and Henry Ford, and he told them, whatever we have going on with us doesn't matter. We got to stop imperialist Japan and we got to stop the Nazis. And the only way I can do it is with you. And the only way we can do it is with you learning what is at stake. And he said something very powerful. The company you built won't be here if Hitler wins. The company you so yearn to protect, the excuse you're giving me that you're not going to build the weapons I need is that you have got to protect your profits. They're not going to be there. Your grandchildren won't have freedom. And that's how he won him. That's the argument for today, Pastor. And I want you to listen to me. Don't tell me that you're afraid of preaching against political immorality. Don't tell me you're afraid of confronting Biden in all his demented madness because you're afraid that they're going to shut down your church. You have no idea. It is in your silence that your church is going to get shut down. It is in your compromise that your church is going to get shut down. If we don't act, that's going to close the door. What Roosevelt did with these corporate titans, the Holy Spirit is doing to the modern church. I'm addressing the president of the Southern Baptist Church. I don't care diddly about your political stance. I don't care anything about the imperatives of the people you have to please. 
Because what matters now is American freedom, American liberty. And if you could look at that drama with the American flag and think that you saw these people dying to hold it up, and we can't even get Olympic athletes to not want to burn it, then you in the Southern Baptist Church need to wake up. There's something more important than arguing about tongues or whether baptism should be immersion or spot removing. The only thing that matters now is American freedom. You know what, I must be getting ready to retire because I'm about to confront the general counsel of the assemblies of God. And you better find your Pentecostal roots today. You better get with all of these rebellious young pastors in your movement and wake them up to understand that we don't care anymore about wokeness. They're a Christian a woke Christian makes as much sense as a screen door on a submarine. There is nothing about wokeness that doesn't hate the Bible. There is nothing about wokeness that doesn't hate man and woman. There's nothing about wokeness that it isn't a direct and existential threat to everything we believe. So the assemblies of God need to wake up. Yes, they do. They need to wake up and all of you men and women of God in that great movement, you need to oppose any leadership in your movement that says we can't preach these things from our pulpit. Then you don't know what's going on. This is a day where the American preacher who is baptized in the Holy Ghost and prays in a heavenly language has got to get in his pulpit and say, we will not endure evil or compromise or allow devils to educate our children. I'm no FDR, I know that. Man, I couldn't take the demotion. Yep. What Roosevelt did with these corporate titans, the Holy Spirit is doing to the modern church. The Holy Spirit He's trying to show us what is at stake. He's trying to create something that will stop the, e the greatest evil the world has ever known. With millions of lives at stake, William Boeing, Henry Ford, Pierre Dupont, Henry J. Kaiser began to build the arsenal of the free world. And what America did next is the stuff of legend. Mr. Boeing proceeded to build, in record time, 98,000 bombers, including the legendary B-17 Flying Fortress. Henry Ford, in his Willow Run factory, was building a B-25 every 60 minutes. Pierre DuPont manufactured 50 million hand grenades. Millions of women went to work. America began to seethe and boil as one beating heart to say, we've got to defeat the evil. DuPont not only built 50 million hand grenades, he built another little bomb called the atomic bomb. 
And up there in Hanford, Washington, he hired 130,000 people to extract the plutonium for the Los Alamos test site. This is a day of tremendous opportunity. This is a day for us to build the churches we've always wanted to build, where truth is freely spoken, where our children are told about their gender, their values, their future, and their life. I wonder if I've made the case yet. You know, I do. Wokeness, socialism, critical race theory are here to destroy your freedom. Either you stop them or they're going to stop your freedom. And there is no middle ground. The leaders of these lies will stop at nothing. They won't stop at anything. We have no choice to face it and destroy it. Fact, no nation has ever lost two generations in a row and survived. We've already lost one. Fact, the second and final generation is being assaulted by the most sophisticated anti-God manipulation technology the world has ever seen. This mechanism of manipulation, big tech, is designed to use the pandemic as the line of credit to undergird and work their evil. The church must get over its fear of a virus. You need to shout right now. We must get over the idea that we can sing a song. I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm too scared to get back in church. No nation has ever lost freedom and regained it. I wonder if I could look you in the eye and tell you this. We either win this or we're lost. We don't have another battle. We can't defer this to another generation. We can't give this up and say, let somebody else do it. You want to understand Marxism? I'm going to read it to you. The whole gospel of Karl Marx can be summed up in a single sentence. Hate the man who is better off than you are. Never, under any circumstances, admit that his success may be due to his own efforts or to the productive contribution he's made to the community. Always attribute his success to the exploitation, the cheating, and the more or less robbery of others. Never, under any circumstances, admit that your own failure may be causing your weakness or that the failure of anyone else is due to their own defects. Let me tell you something very important. We're watching Canada turned into an armed camp. We're watching Australia reverting back to the penal colony it was at one time. It's turning back into Botany Bay. We're Americans. God help me. We are Americans. We don't do slavery well. We're not good slaves, and we never have been. And the minute you tell us we can't do something, we're going to start a company just to do it. Whatever they had in 1941, we need in this room. We need it in this room. 
We need to reach critical mass that says, God, you are the God of the Azusa Street Revival. You are the God of the Welsh Revival. You are the God that raised up Billy Graham and Oral Roberts, and you did the Jesus Movement. Now we need two streams of Christian faith to come together as one. The Christian patriot and the spirit-filled Pentecostal, full of the fire of God. Let's come together. Let's come together. Please remain standing. Bow your heads and let's pray. If ever I had the right to say what I'm about to say, I have the right to say it in this pulpit. There's a good news to this. There's a good news to this. Lurking in all the clouds of darkness and despair is something so glorious that it beggars my vocabulary. God is rolling up his sleeves. He's sending out a signal. He's saying, how would you like a fresh anointing? God is rolling up his sleeves and saying, how would you like a tongue and wisdom that no man and none of your adversaries will be able to gainsay nor resist. How would you like the weapons that are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds, tearing down every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? the two-edged sword of the anointed, radically fired up political leader and the man and woman in the pulpit who says, I am dead to self. My board can control me. My denomination cannot control me. My day is the day of truth and to preach it with absolute and total faith. Now let me tell you something. God says some of the best books ever written are yet to be written. Some of the best evangelistic crusades that have ever happened in America are waiting to happen. Yes, even eclipsing Billy Sunday and even Amy McPherson. There are times of refreshing coming from the throne of God. And God is looking for people who in their stomach are so sick of waiting. The pain of being average is too great for them. They want God to do a new thing. Some of you, they're trying to get you to go and gum applesauce at Leisure World. But God's going to refire you. He's going to reanimate your bones. He's going to put a new anointing on you. Let me ask you, how many of you in this room are ready before God to start a new era of American freedom? Yeah. Shout. Now look me right in the eye because I feel very strongly that I'm to turn this back to Brother Womack in just a moment. I could pray for you. I have prayed for you. I know how to do altar calls and all that. But I think in this telling moment that if I were to finish my final remarks to say the evil is great, but God is greater. But I want to say something else. 
the moment of building the greatest visions, the most astonishing new ideas, technology, the idea that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just is not, it's not enough for us to believe that because God wants warriors of wealth that will go and get it and put it in the kingdom. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that we still have a chance to do something big for God? Do you? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail down my confirmation. This building, this property, at 9,000 feet. <laughs> you have got to be under grievous conviction if you can stand on this property and not say God is still able to do something mighty. Thank you, my brother. Hallelujah. And do y'all agree? Thank you, Lord. I tell you what, we are, as Mario said, I agree 100% with what he's saying, but there is no neutral in this fight. You are fighting for survival, and I believe we're going to win. But... It is a fight for survival. Some people think that this will blow over as so many other things have, but I've never seen ungodliness rise this quickly, this widespread. This is a battle for the life of this nation. I heard one man say that the main thing is to preach the gospel, but the next important thing is to maintain the freedom to preach the gospel. And we can't divorce those two things. And so praise God, I am glad that you are here. I think we're off to a great start.